a capital basis, and 20 years from now it'll grow in a lot faster internationally than in the U.S. So I really like that market market better because there, there is more growth there over time. But it, it will hurt them in the in, in the it is hurting them in the short term right now. And but that that doesn't mean anything. I mean that uh, uh, Coca Cola went public in I think it was 1919. Stock sold for forty dollars a share. It went back before that as the Candler family, and they they went back. They bought it for two thousand bucks. The whole business, uh, as the Candler, back in the late eighteen eighties, and a couple of purchases. So now he goes public in nineteen nineteen, forty dollars a share. One year later, it's selling for nineteen dollars, gone down fifty percent in one year. Now you might think that's some kind of disaster, and you might think that. Sugar prices increased and the bottlers were rebellious and a whole bunch of things. You could always find a few reasons why that wasn't the ideal moment to buy it. Years later, you'd have seen the Great Depression, then you'd have seen World War II, and you'd seen sugar rationing, and you'd seen thermonuclear weapons, and the whole thing. There's always a reason. But in the end, if you would bought one share for 40 bucks and reinvested the dividends, it'd be worth about $5 million now. And that factor so overrides anything else. I mean, if you're right about the business, you'll make a lot of money. and and the timing part of it is very is, is a very tricky thing. So I don't worry about any given event if I've got a wonderful business, uh, you know, whether what it does to next year or something of the sort. But, uh, um, you know, the price controls have been in this country at various times, and that's that's followed up even the best of businesses. I mean, I wouldn't be able to raise the price on December 26th of these candy if we had price controls, and we've had them in this country. But that doesn't make it a lousy business if that happens to happen, because you're not going to have price controls forever. Uh, we had them in the early in the early 70s. So it, it the wonderful business, you know, you can figure out what will happen. You can't figure out when it will happen. You don't want to focus too much on when. You want to focus on what. But if you're right about what, you don't have to worry about when very much. Is there an area I'm missing back there any place? I just want to make sure I'm not focusing all of them on one place. Let me get this gentleman over here. The question is about my business mistakes. How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the interesting thing about the mistakes is that in investments, at least for me and for my partner, Charlie Munger, the biggest mistakes have not been mistakes of, of commission. They've been mistakes of omission. They're where we knew enough about the business to do something, and for one reason or another, we sat there sucking our thumbs instead of doing something. And so we've, we've passed up things where we could have made billions and billions of dollars from things we understood. Forget about things we don't understand. We don't, the fact that I could make billions out of Microsoft doesn't mean anything because I never understand Microsoft. But if I can make billions out of healthcare stocks, then I shouldn't make it, and I didn't. You know, when 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 the Clinton health care program was proposed and they all went in the tank, uh, we should have made a ton of money out of that uh, because I could understand it. And I, I didn't make it. I should have made a ton of money out of Fannie Mae back in the mid '80s because I understood it and I didn't do it. Those are billion-dollar mistakes or multi-billion-dollar mistakes that the generally accepted accounting principles don't pick up. Uh, the mistakes you see, the mistakes you see, we, we made a isn't we, I made a mistake uh, buying uh, U.S. Air Preferred some years ago. I mean, it, uh, I had a lot of money around. I, I make mistakes when I get cash. Charlie tells me to go to a bar instead. You know, don't hang around the office. But I, I hang around the office, and I got money in my pocket. I do something dumb, and, and it happens every time. And, and uh, so I, I bought this thing. Nobody made me buy it. I now have a 800 number I call every time I think about buying stock in an airline, and they talk me down. They say, you know, I say, well, I'm worn, I'm an aeroholic, and then the guy says, you know, <laughs> keep talking, don't hang up, you know, don't do anything rash, and finally I get over it. Uh, but I, but I, I, I bought it, you know, and uh, it looked like we were going to lose all our money in that, and we came very close to losing all our money, and, and you can say we deserved to lose all our money. And we bought it because it was an attractive security, but it was in a, not in an attractive business. I did the same thing with Solomon. That I bought an attractive security in a, in a business that I wouldn't have bought the equity in. So you can say that that's one form of mistake, buying something because you like the terms when you don't like the business that well. And I've, I've, I've done that in the past. I'll probably do it again. Uh, the, the bigger mistakes, though, are the ones of, of omission. Uh, I did, back, back when, I was, when I had the 10000 bucks, I put $2,000 of it into a Sinclair service station, which I lost. So my opportunity cost on that's about six billion right now. I've, uh, <laughs> fairly big mistake. Yeah.
It makes me feel good when Berkshire goes down then because the cost of my Sinclair station goes down too. <laughs> my 20% opportunity cost. <laughs> but I will say this. You talk about learning from mistakes. I really believe it's better to learn from other people's mistakes as much as possible. But, uh, but we don't spend any time looking back at Berkshire. Uh, I've got a partner, Charlie Munger. We've been pals for 40 years. We've never had an argument. We disagree on things a lot, but we, but we but we don't we don't have arguments about it, and we never look back. We just you know we just figure there's so much to look forward to that there's just no sense thinking about what we might. Have. It, it it just doesn't make any difference. I mean, you you can only live life forward, and you can learn something perhaps from the mistakes. But the the big thing to do is stick with the businesses you understand, and uh, so if there's a generic mistake of of getting outside of your circle of competence and you know, buying something because somebody tips you on it or something of the sort in, in an area you don't know anything about. I mean, that you should learn something from that, which is that you stay with what you can figure out yourself. I mean, you really want your decision making to be by looking in the mirror and uh, saying to yourself, I'm buying 100 shares of General Motors at 55 because. And I mean, it's your responsibility if you're buying it. And there's got to be a reason. And if you can't state the reason, you shouldn't buy it. If it's because somebody told you about it at a cocktail party, not good enough, you know. I mean, there's just, it's got to be something, you know, can't be because the, the volume, you know, the chart looks good on it or anything like that. It's got it's to be a reason you'd buy the business. And we, that we stick to pretty, pretty carefully. That's one of the things Ben Graham taught me. about what's going to happen to interest rates or where we go in the world. I don't think about the macro stuff. You know, I, I just, um, the important, what you really want to do in investments is figure out what's important and knowable. If it's unimportant or unknowable, you, you forget about it. What you talk about is important, but in my view, it's not knowable. Understanding Coca-Cola is knowable or Wrigley or Eastman Kodak or anything. I mean, you can understand those businesses. That's knowable. And <coughs> whether it turns out to be important depends on where your valuation leads you into the current price and all of that. But we have never either bought a business or not bought a business because of any macro feeling of any kind. We don't read things about predictions about interest rates or business or anything like that because it doesn't make any difference. I mean, let's say in 1972 when we bought C's Candy, I think maybe Nixon put on the price controls a little bit later. Let's say we'd seen that. But so what? We'd have missed a chance to buy something for $25 million that's earning $60 million pre-tax now. I mean, we'd, we don't want to pass up the chance to do something intelligent because of some prediction about something that we're no good on it anyway. So we, we just don't, we don't read or listen to or do anything in relation to, to macro factors at all, zero. And the typical investment counseling organization goes out and they, give you the, they bring out their economists, they trot them out and he gives you this big macro picture and then they start working from there on down. In our view, that's nonsense. It, uh, uh, and if, if you know, if, if Alan Greenspan was on one side of me and Bob Rubin on the other side, they were both whispering in my ear exactly what they're going to do the next 12 months. Wouldn't make any difference to me in what I pay for executive jet or general reinsurance or anything else I do.